Alright, so I am Ryan for Puppet Labs. I'm responsible for our Puppet Forge project, but uh, I was a sysadmin at Penn State. That's where I came from. Has anybody heard of Shibboleth before? Okay, a couple of Shibboleth people. Usually I'm in, not in good company there, but I'm, I'm excited to be a web assign because uh, back at Penn State, I was responsible for the Shibboleth infrastructure, and one of the things, one of the people who would set up with us was web assign. Some Penn State students wanted to use web assign stuff. So, uh, it's always fun to go and see, oh, I added them, I put them in the art. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of cool. So I was responsible for uh, a lot of Penn State's core infrastructure as a system in there. I moved on to Puppet Labs to be a services engineer because I used Puppet to automate a lot of Penn State's infrastructure. I wanted to keep doing Puppet. So then I switched to being in product because I didn't want to fly around the world constantly. I got burned out of that about eight months in. So. That's my story. I want to tell you a little bit about configuration management in general. And I want this title bar to go away. All right. So I'm going to give you a use case here. And I think, as Mark mentioned, it's not important to say, oh, well, are you using Chef or are you using CF Engine or are you using Puppet? It's more important that you're using configuration management and you're using these tools to solve real problems. So I'm just going to walk you through a use case here in case you're coming to this group, you're unfamiliar with this space. If you're managing a user Elmo and you care about a couple of things, you have a number of utilities that you can use for managing various things with Elmo. But what happens when you try to manage multiple platforms, the commands for managing those users are different, you're going to have to remember the differences between them. Different flags mean different things, even on the same utilities across operating systems. If you've been there, you know this. And so you could do some bash scripting and come up with something like this. And this is even kind of a more advanced bash script that asks the system what the state is and then attempts to take actions based on that state. But it's still, you still kind of have to read it carefully to understand what's going on. And it's not, it's not a model of your infrastructure. Right? It's just some procedures. And it also doesn't do any of these things. It doesn't help you do error checking when things go wrong. It doesn't give you support for platforms that doesn't have batch. It uh, doesn't give you logging that, hey, I went and checked this group, and the Elmo group did exist, and I went and you know, didn't do anything to it, or I needed to add Elmo. Give you that logging back. And that last one, readable code, that one, of course, is one of my favorite pieces. When I would start building Shibboleth with uh, other administrators at Penn State, the expression in Puppet of what it took to build our Shibboleth infrastructure not only let me do peer review and make sure that we're doing everything right with my, my peer sysadmin, but the guy who was responsible for Shibboleth at Penn State didn't care how the systems were configured, but he wanted, to, he wanted some kind of reference that they were the same, and he was able to look at a Puppet manifest and say, hey, this is how the system is configured. I understand that. I know these files. I know these are the things I care about. And now I know that they're all in the same state. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so that's a very simple Puppet DSL. So this is saying I have this bucket of things that I wish to configure. That's what we call a class, in this case, sysadmins. And for that bucket sysadmins, I care about managing user Elmo and a group named sysadmin. And then everything between after user and group is just the properties you care about. One of the core things behind Puppet is that you only manage the thing you actually care about. So for instance, on this user, I specifically stated that I want the user to be present, that its group is going to be sysadmin, it's GID sysadmin, it has a home directory, and I wish to manage it. But I didn't say anything about the shell or any of the other properties that you could manage about this user, so Puppet won't either. Puppet will only manage the things that you want to manage. And this is more real. This is an exact replacement for the shell script. But it's a lot more real. And that Shibboleth example has really helped me with people that weren't in operations, that weren't developers, just understand how their systems are configured, and they were just a lot more confident about what, the, what we were doing to their systems because of that. So another big core tenet behind Puppet and other configuration management systems is being able to check the state of the system that you're running on see what's going on, and make changes where appropriate. So in the case of Puppet, you have a desired state. And that's uh, Elmo. Sorry, I'm trying to select that. That's Elmo. He's present. His group ID is this. His home directory is that. 
And any time that would change on the system, whether it's because you haven't configured that system yet, or that system's been changed manually or by some script, we call that drift. And Puppet will know how to inspect, hey, user download is there, but his GID and his home directory are different. And so I'm going to convert them. And you just go in this loop. It's this kind of rinse and repeat loop. You define the state of that machine. Puppet runs and it inspects the state of the machine. It'll converge any changes that are necessary, and then, of course, report on what happened. All right, and that can be anything from just saying, hey, I created a user Elmo to, hey, all these properties changed, or you know, all the kind of details you might want to get into that, you can get as, as complex or as simple as you want. And again, it's just about maintaining that state. You're defining what it is in this bucket here. I want this user, I want this group, I need this package installed, this file should look a particular way. Anything you want to manage on your systems, you express that in a simple language, and then let this loop continue to configure and manage your system. So that's kind of just the gist behind configuration management software, and Puppet specifically. And another key idea here is that it's item potent. You can run it multiple times, and it's not going to attempt to run the same commands over and over again. It's not going to try to create that user five times. It'll run, do its business. In the second run, you see there's nothing happening there, because Puppet will say, all right, I've been told I should have this user. I'm going to check on that user. Oh, he's exactly what I told him to be. I'm not going to do a thing, right? And when I showed you that user and their group, those are just the building blocks. There's are individual resources within Puppet, and you use those resources composed together to model whatever it is you're building. Whether for me it was a, a shiplet identity authority, or you're building you know, your SSH service, whatever you want. And there's a, another key point to drive home here that we're about declaring the state of the system you want, not about the procedure and actions you need to take to do it. So if you look at a bash scripting example and you say, all right, even though I'm mimicking the ability to inspect the state of the system and only take action when I need to, it's still going through this procedure of running the script, going through the logic, and you're still expressing your configuration in that way. Software like Puppet and Chef ask you to define your configuration as something more declared. Say it's the state of the system you want. In Puppet's case, user Elmo, the properties I care about, the same thing with the group. This is my infrastructure and the state I want it to be. It's Puppet's job to figure out how to make the changes when necessary, how to do X, Y, and Z. It's not up to you to define it. And we do that through an abstraction layer, so you can have that user and group work on any operating system that Puppet supports. So in this package instance, on the back end, Puppet's going to be interacting with Yum, or it's going to interact with Act, whatever it needs. But we built that abstraction layer for you, so you don't have to specify it unless you are very particular. And then you can specify it. Now I really want you to use Yum. So this is just an example of each resource type. Anything you want to manage in Puppet is abstracted in this way. And there are more than just what I'm showing you there, but for package, for instance, we support really anything I can think of, including Arch and all the package providers there. So to reiterate, Puppet is about defining the state of your infrastructure. And I think this is a point that sometimes gets lost. That doesn't have to be everything you're doing today. That can just be, hey, you know, every time I bring up a machine, I've got to configure NTP or install VMware tools or something like that. Something just takes up a couple minutes every time you configure a machine. Start with that. That's your definition. That's your design state. You can run public on that machine, and all it manages for the rest of its life is NTP, and you do everything else manually. But now you have NTP, and you don't have to do it again. And as you're building extra pieces in, you can add them into the cycle. So another key feature here is the simulation side of things. So because Puppet can inspect the state of every resource, know what the state of the user is on your system or the group is on your system, it can simulate what would change without making, taking any action. So it's really just specifying a specific switch to Puppet. And then it'll say, hey, user Elmo is present, but his GID is different than what you desire. So what I would do is change it from sysadmin to foo. But it'll tell you what it would do, a simulation of its enforcement, but not actually do that. Then, of course, you can enforce the run, it's the normal mode, and then it reports back on anything it changes. 
if you want to get more technical with it, Puppet, every Puppet node has a thing called facts, which is just information about it. If you've used any of these tools, you're pretty familiar with it. It's just things like, this is my operating system, my IP address, all my interfaces, all the various details you might need to help dynamically configure that host. It sends those to the Puppet Master. The Puppet Master contains all the definitions of what it is to be a machine that has NTP. Or whatever. That catalog is an artifact that is unique only to the node you're managing. We call that a catalog, and that is really just a set of instructions that apply explicitly to your node. So your Puppet Master might have the definition for all your machines across all your data centers, development, production, whatever, but that Puppet node that you're managing only knows the instructions that are specific to it. This tool Factor I was talking about, some of the example output, if you've never seen Puppet and Factor before, it's just key value pairs of something about my system and the value about it. Before I get into this section, it dawned on me that because of the display issues, I didn't tell you what I, was, what I was going for here. This is an overview of Puppet, obviously. I'm going to transition to talking about the Puppet Forge, the product I manage, and then I'm going to go deep dive on data bindings and higher, one of the features for specifying things about your configuration. Mm -hmm. Side note. So the Puppet Forge is a place where, and if, if Chef users are in the room, think community at opscode.com, forge.puppetlabs.com is a site where you define whatever it is in your infrastructure, again, that NTP service, your shibboleth service, Apache, whatever it is you want to configure, someone's done that already, they've shared it up to this site where other people can download it, they can go find the source code, they can make patches, submit that back up. It is a service just for finding that pre built content and sharing your own. So there's a tool that ships within Puppet called the Puppet Module Tool that allows you to list modules that you already have installed. Modules is that container of things that describes, hey, this is an NTP service, or this is Shibboleth, and so on. You can, of course, search the forge from this tool in case you're saying, oh, well, somebody told me about this module, but I don't quite remember the name. You can search for it and then install it, which isn't there. But here's an example of one of the module pages you might find for Apache. And generally, someone submitted a readme along with it that says, hey, this is my module, this is what it does, this is how you use it. <coughs> so in this case, you just go to the website, you find, okay, this is what the model's going to do for me. You can go and, and use it directly. You'll find things even like this, which I think are kind of cool, just extensions to Factor itself. So the Factor doesn't have to ship everything in the universe. And someone on the porch can submit something called a warranty module, and for them, what is it? Dell, Lenovo, and Macintosh systems. He knows how to he wrote a fact. He knows how to inspect the serial number of the system, and then he calls against that vendor's website, submits the serial number, retrieves the warranty information, and returns them as facts that you can get on your individual node. So, do I have a warranty? What's the warranty for? When does it expire? And you can use that information either just for inventory gathering or within every one of those puppet manifests. You could say, well, if I don't have a warranty. Maybe I need to do some things to the system. People that need to start to manage network devices with Puppet, this has been going on for a long time with Cisco devices and F5 devices, but more recently, uh, Juniper Networks has submitted this content to the Forge for interacting with their switches. They're FreeBSD-based devices, and they, they got a package of Puppet running on their flavor of FreeBSD. And then they've written types of providers saying, hey, this is how I would go and implement a trunk or a VLAN or whatever it is I want to figure out my Juniper switches. I think I have an example. I don't. But on this site, if you scroll down a little bit, there's examples on how to use it. You can go and say, this is what my switch looks like. Plug it into the rack, contact your puppet master, gets all this port configuration, gets the VLAN assigned, ports get trunked, whatever you need. So that's kind of cool to see. And that's the end of this. Let me switch over to my code versus data slide. So are there any questions of a general nature before I go into the more specific stuff to Puppet? Yes. Yeah, that uh, the module list, is that just, are those just the modules that are from the Puppet Forge, or, or if you wrote any of your own modules, would that show the list as well? So the, Puppet, the question was, what is that Puppet Module List tool showing? And that's showing the, uh, the modules that you have installed. So it will even show you the local ones, but it does look at a piece of metadata to get things like version out of the module. So if you submitted your own metadata uh, for your own local module, it will list those out too with their versions. 
and even their dependencies too if you want. And there's a uh, docs.bubblelabs.com if you search for module publishing, it points you right to it. Any other general questions about what I show, what configuration management is? I'm guessing, how many of you are using something CF Engine, Puppet, Chef already? Okay. I thought I didn't want to spend too much time covering it, but I didn't want to not lead in with something. So. All right. So bear with me here. I want to talk about separating your the configuration from the data that informs it. And I'm going to do that by way of an analogy. You're over at the university, you're in the library, you need to, you have a research project, you need to start studying, so you start grabbing some books and you start taking some notes. Right? You've got your books, or whatever it is you're trying to learn, but you're writing your notes, and hopefully you're writing them separately. The book belongs to the library, it describes whatever it is to do this crazy astrophysics thing that you're learning how to do. And you're taking notes on that that informs how you're interpreting that, how you're learning about that, the kind of data that you need to put that into action. So take that analogy to the configuration of your infrastructure. So if I have a simple puppet manifest like this, again, the class keyword is just sort of a bucket. I'm saying forge is my bucket. And inside that, I just have one resource called package. But here I'm saying the package is Nginx, and the version must be 101. This expression works just fine. Puppet will manage it. It all works great. But the problem is, if now you have two machines that want two specific versions, you've got to duplicate this file, and now you have two class forges that you have to keep in sync, and it gets really complicated. So the idea you should strive for is a scenario where you have variable lines, the things that need variable lines, and maybe it'll always be the Nginx package, and that should never be something that you can just tweak on the fly, but maybe you still keep the version variable so that you can tweak that at any time. I'm going to explain these concepts in a second, but basically the bottom line is a more advanced class that passes in data. All right, so we're going to interact with that data. And we're going to do that via this data bindings feature that was introduced in Puppet 3.0. And effectively, it's an abstraction layer on top of Hira. Has anybody used Hira before? So a couple of you, Hira is a configuration data store that says, all right, it's kind of like factor in that it's key value pairs, but it's key value pairs about data for your infrastructure. I need a package name for this particular package, here's my package. I need a version for Nginx, it's 102. Hira is good at saying, I've stored this data, and I'm going to retrieve it. We're going to go more in depth on that. Sorry, I should have had this slide. Key value lookup system configuration data. So a lot of people are intimidated in front because it's, it's a little more, Puppet is, is kind of very verbose about what's happening and what's going on, and Hira isn't as much. But as soon as you get the core concepts down, it's actually really quite simple and elegant. So I'm going to attempt to walk you through it. So you have a Puppet Master, this guy, this, the central authority of your infrastructure is where all the nodes you're managing connect into. And that Puppet Master has a secret agent. And that agent has information about himself. He identifies himself as James Bond. He's running the Red Hat operating system. These are facts about James Bond. So whenever that agent checks in, he submits those facts to the Puppet Master. And the Puppet Master says, great, James Bond has checked in, and he is Red Hat-based operating system. What do I do now? So the Puppet Master goes through a process called node classification. It, it, there's a built-in way of node classification, and then there's this concept of external node classification. But basically, just know that the Puppet Master then says, great, James Bond checks in. I need to know what he is to enforce, what configuration applies to him. And so he queries this external node classifier, and let's imagine that he gets back Forge. You're to enforce Forge now. So the next step is the Puppet Master says, OK, I've been told I need to enforce Forge. Well, what's Forge? So it looks through all the modules on your Puppet Master, all that configuration code, it's looking for a Forge class, and it finds a Forge class that looks like the one I just showed you. In this case, the class Forge says, I need two pieces of data, package name and package version. And I use those pieces of data to build out the package on my system. So now the Puppet Master knows that it needs Forge package. So now it needs to know the value of Forge package. What is that package? So it uses another abstraction layer, data bindings. And data bindings by default uses higher. 
higher is that key value stores, the software as a project that we maintain, and ship inside the So higher is all about hierarchies of data. And the whole concept behind this is that you have some business logic, and it's up to you whatever it is, but you're saying, when a machine checks in, yeah, so he's forged, but I have things I need to tweak. I need certain package versions installed. Maybe this guy's going to get an entirely different configuration based on his data center. And all these kind of things that you might want to make decisions on, Hire is all about giving you a hierarchy to select from. So the hierarchy that I've chosen here says I'm going to take the certificate name of the agent, and I'm going to look for data that applies specifically to the client certificate name. If that doesn't work out, the next step is to look at the operating system level for data. So if you remember, James Bond is a Red Hat-based system. So he's going to go ahead and say, OK, all the data that applies to Red Hat systems, do I have a match there? And then it moves on to a static file called comp. So a very simple hierarchy, but you can use any fact that you get from Puppet to build your hierarchy. So let's go a little deeper on that. Hierarchy is also not specific about how you store your data. So the data about your nodes you can store in many backends. By default, there's a YAML and JSON backend. So you can store your configuration data in structured, structured text. You can check it into version control, all that good stuff. If that doesn't work for you, there are other examples. You can have it in a MySQL database, in Redis, all over the place. But the key point there is that the data, where you store it, is up to you with Hiram. But let's say it goes through data bindings, it contacts Hira, it goes through my hierarchy, and then it gets back the package name of screen. So now my puppet master knows, oh, I had the forged package variable, I needed to know what the value was, Hira told me it's screen. How did it know that? So on the left side up top, you have the hierarchy that I put in there. Remember that James Bond sent facts to the puppet master, and those facts were, my client cert is James Bond, I'm a Red Hat operating system, common is just a static thing, it's not a fact. So based on that information, and based on the hierarchy of client server operating system and then common, I'm going to look up data in these three files. This is just structured text in YAML format, it's the default backend for hierarchy. And there it's just again key value stores. So I have region is US, puppet DB database is embedded for Red Hat, and then finally in that common file I have forge packages screen. And all I was doing is saying, all right, I'll check James Bond, nope, no forge package. Check Red Hat, no forge package. It moves on to the bottom of the hierarchy. And it'll do this for any configuration data you're looking up. Configuring hierarchy, just as a side note, it's pretty simple. You say, hey, these are the these are where I expect you to find your configuration data, and these are that hierarchy for lookup. Simple as that. So how would Puppet interact with this? I want to tie this together and then we can talk about it some more. But it used to be that you'd interact with Hira directly in what's called a parser function. So the class forge would have package calls out directly to Hira in that third line. So that walked you into Hira. You didn't get any of the abstraction that data bindings give you, and you didn't get any of the automatic lookup that data bindings give you. So we moved on to this pattern. It's a very slight change. See, I noticed we moved from line three to line two, still using the higher function, but now it's in this language construct called parameterize class, and that means you can overwrite it. So now you didn't have to use higher, but higher was the same default. It would default to looking up against higher. But at the end of the day, if you're using Puppet 3 and you want to take advantage of this, you create a, at the very top, is that structured data file that says, all right, for whatever it is in my hierarchy, I have this key forge package and the value is screen. Remember again that the hierarchy is configurable to you. So you might say, a guy in the East Coast data center gets a particular version, and a guy in the other, uh, the West Coast data center gets a different version. Just facts that you get in, you can make decisions based on that. When you're defining your infrastructure code, you would just say class forge, package equals SSH, and that tells Puppet, all right, I need a piece of data, and it has a default value. The piece of data I need is package, and the default value of package is SSH. So at that point, there's just a simple lookup order that Puppet will use every time it runs. The first is to take something explicit. 
If you declared your class, if you said, hey, this machine gets a very specific version of this package in that top right image, in this case, this guy must get screen, then Puppet will respect that. The second step in this lookup will be to query data bindings. Right? So it'll say, all right, I need force package, I'm going to contact Hira, I'm going to go through my hierarchy, I'm going to find that data. If it goes through all of those steps and doesn't find any data for force package, it'll move on to using that default value of SSH, and then it'll fail, as you might expect it to, saying, I don't have this data, I don't know what you want me to do. So data bindings is about abstracting all the things, as Puppet Labs likes to do. It defaults to using Hira, so you don't have to worry about that. You just want to get started with Hira and Puppet 3. It's in by default. But if you don't want to use Hira, you can swap something out like Foreman. Anybody use Foreman in here? A couple of you? Red Hat territory, I expect a lot more. Uh, yeah, so if you're using Foreman and you specify all your configuration data in Foreman, you can still write Puppet without having to explicitly call out the Foreman. So you can have a clean manifest describing your infrastructure, but let data bindings call out to Foreman to get the data. So that's really kind of it for data bindings. It sounds a lot more complicated than it is. It just it automatically looks up against Hira for your configuration data. And the biggest thing to take away is just its lookup order. That's the piece that people find most magic. It'll take your explicit configuration, then it'll query Hira, then it'll use a default value, but then it'll fail out of the can't find it. I think that's it. Uh, other than on the Puppet Forge, if you want to see other higher backends, I have two examples here, the MySQL backend and a REST backend. There's several others up there as well, but I think those are the two examples. That's it. So, do you have any questions for me? Let me put up a slide that's probably the most, <coughs> that one's the most complicated business, right? Is anybody already using data bindings with Puppet? You are? Are you happy with it? Uh, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't, I, don't um, I haven't got to the extent of where I'm trying to package things with it, and that is key to me, it's really valuable, especially if you're managing like a, a multi-operating system environment where Red Hat package is named different, or Young package is named different than, yeah. you know, an AppGet resource package, like AppGet and uh, I can see that being very valuable. Cool. And keep in mind, you can use this for any configuration data you want. So anytime in a puppet manifest you want to say, hey, this thing needs to be variable, it's just a variable in puppet, and then it expects to find that variable in Hira as one of your lookup values. Look at that. So in the OS case, um, where, how do you combine uh, your hierarchy so that there's two if anybody didn't hear the question, it was a question of whether or not you could have two levels in the hierarchy that get combined together, like operating system, operating system version. It depends, is the answer. Uh, string types, if you're looking for just a string value back, Hyra will look in the hierarchy and choose the first one it hits. So you'll have to design your hierarchy to account for that. Whatever business logic you want to say, this guy gets hit first, and if he found it, he succeeds. But for data types like arrays and hashes, it will continue through the entire hierarchy until it's exhausted its options, and it'll combine them together into an array or a hash. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, well, this isn't a higher question, but maybe fine. So can you talk about um, some of the recent changes to Puppet, like the evolution of Puppet 267 would be asked what major changes are? Yeah, I, I absolutely can. Yeah, so as you're thinking of questions, it doesn't have to be about data bindings. <coughs> Puppet Labs can grill me about almost anything. And on that specifically, so uh, first we'll start with a poll. How many people are running Puppet 025 and earlier? Anybody? With a quick hand. Don't look at me. Uh, so how about Puppet 26? Puppet 2.6, Puppet 2.6, Puppet 2.7? 3.0. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting mix. So, the evolution of things. Uh, 
Back in the 025 days, that was when our, our CEO, Luke Canise, was writing the software to do his own work, and it was just a project that he maintained. Uh, the two, when we went to 2.6, that was kind of a symbolic change into the era where Luke was running a company, and he was trying to be a little more careful about how he versioned his software and what stuff he put into it. Uh, but it was a company of like three people. So Puppet 2.7 went was the next version when we had an engineering department dedicated to Puppet, and then 3.0 is recently, as of like September of last year, was when we released it. So in terms of how the company was wrapped around it, that's how it goes. But in terms of what's in it, so Puppet 2.6 introduced parameterized classes, which is a language feature that it is really heavily used, especially if you ever visit the Forge. That's just a way of expressing a class so that you can pass data into it. Of course, data bindings leverages that feature, so that was new to 2.6. Back there, if you want to use data bindings, it created 3.0. Uh, 2.6 to 2.7. Uh, to be honest, from 2.6 to 2.7, we got slower. We got a lot slower on some of those things, so we moved away from. Uh, oh, let me get this wrong. I forget exactly what it was, but we moved our backend implementation for routing all of our code to something more maintainable, but that slowed things down. We corrected that in 3.0. 3.0 is actually faster than 2.6. A lot faster. So 3.0. So there are speed improvements in the series there. And in terms of features, in the 3 series, we now even have a, a new parser in 3.2 that you can enable. It's not a default parser yet, but it's there. And that parser will allow you to do iteration. So it has, it has a number of features, but iteration is one of them. So you can enable that with the new parser. Uh, I'll draw on blanks on major features otherwise. Uh, send me an email, ryanpublabs.com, and I'll, I can get you bullet points that I can sit and think about. Thank you. But what's the successor, if there is one, to the Ruby DSL for Cloud? So the Ruby DSL has had a sorted history. So the language that I've been showing you all night is our regular DSL for interacting with Puppet, but we did have, and still do have, a raw Ruby DSL for interacting with Puppet. So just side note on that, it was a Google Summer of Code project to implement it the first time, then it was another Google Summer of Code project to build the replacement for it, but that wasn't able to get into Puppet because it ended up being too heavily intertwined into how Puppet was implemented. It didn't use the right abstraction layers on anything, so it meant that if we implemented that Ruby DSL, now you can't ever change how Puppet's implemented without ripping everyone's parser out. It's the two-second version of that. That said, that future Puppet DSL parser we put out there does have iteration support and a couple other things that we scraped out of the Ruby DSL, the pieces that we could maintain, ended up moving into the regular DSL. So if you were looking at the Ruby DSL for iteration support, we're solving that problem in the regular DSL. And I think we're probably going to take that drop from here on out. It's so much easier to manage for us. Um, I've read a few articles recently on. Um, people running a Puppet infrastructure without the Puppet Master, everything in standalone mode. Uh, I wonder if you have any comments or experiences with that. So that's a common rubbo, really. Um, we call that Masterless, and the guy who wrote Hyra and M Collective, Ari Pinar, he runs Masterless, because he just has, he has locations all over the world that he does for his, he, he used to do consulting, because we had infrastructure all over the world. And he just found that to be more flexible for him, so it's a fully supported run mode. It doesn't limit you in any way. And the things that you lose when you go that way is somewhat obvious, but you now have all the configuration that you want to ship around is now exposed to that node. So if you if you end up saying, all right, here's my Git repo of all my infrastructure, and you check out that Git repo on every one of your nodes, if one node's compromised, not everybody knows how things are configured on all the other systems. Uh, but you can still interact with Hyra, you can still use data bindings, you can even use PuppetDB to export resources. That one is a little bit, you have to do some extra configuration to get it to not work in a master mode, but it, it works. And it's something where we continue to support. Do you know of any way, um, if you just find it somewhere to look, that you can get like the runtime statistics like from the come from Puppet dashboard? Um, Those are in every Puppet report. Uh, if you if you email me Brian at I'll send you the exact doc. 
but effectively, you would just take the report and say, I want this report in structured data format, and it will have all the statistics in structured data. Okay. Is there a will there be a way to run a file server that is not on a public master? File server being not on a puppet master. Yes. Now, that may not be exactly what you think it means. We're definitely moving away from having the file serving of a puppet master be in the puppet master role, but we will still, we'll, so we're going to be splitting file serving away in future versions of puppet, but it will still be puppet serving files. That's like, what I want. I just, the uh, public colon slash slash slash, I mean, what's the point? It has to be puppet master. So. Okay. Yeah, so I think we're going to get a lot closer for you there. And that probably, yeah, that will be a, like a major release or two from that. Yeah, I'd like to put the, the, some of the files on a system to which I do have access that is in the public hierarchy rather than on the public master, which requires going through a bunch of hoops. Yeah, I agree. What's the thought of a, on a simplified version of factor or higher where you can say, take an AI style file, find variables, and feed that into your manifest? Right now, I run a master list. I have basically individual manifests from my different environments, and they can set up my variables and all that off. So I don't have internet here, but you may want to go to the forge, forgeupoflabs.com and search for the system module. So that is someone who's implemented a module that's really just anything in the public DSL is just a wrapper around things, and then he uses higher for expressing both the resource that you want and all of its value pairs. So he's he's done that without having to change the software at all. And it's it's bizarre for me to look at, but it works and he loves it. It's basically just abstracting out of any configuration just like yeah. here's my iPad get to someone and they can define all the variables and like, you know. Yeah, you can kind of get there with that. There's also a project called um, Fact.D um, that you can uh, integrate and basically it gives you uh, uh, etsy slash facts.d and you can put text files, the only file, JSON files, and actually execute those in there. And as long as the you know, factor will basically parse those files or run the executable, whichever it is, and present those as facts to your machine. Yeah, because I, I found factor and higher to be the most most effort to least not least reward, but there, there are the hardest parts of puppet to render it around. Okay. Like it's other than the manifest are relatively simple. Cool. Check that out and uh, feel free to send me a note if you didn't get me going before there and follow up. So I, I'll be around too if you just want to ask me a question in person. And uh, thank you all for dealing with my very sleepy head getting up flying in from the Pacific Coast early this morning. Way out of it. Thank you for your time.